Good evening everybody, I hope you can hear us. Please can you let us know if you can hear us, pop up a message in the chat, we'll just make sure it is working. We'll give it a few minutes and then we'll make a start in a moment. Brilliant, thank you to the people who are replying, that's excellent. Fantastic. Right, I'm going to turn that off now so we're not watching ourselves. <laughs> we'll just give it one more minute and then we will get going. Okay, should we make a start? Let's go for it. Good evening everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk on the Paul Harbour Osprey Translocation Project. My name is Brittany Maxted. I manage the Translocation Project and I'm also a part-time PhD student at Bournemouth University studying Ospreys. And I have beside me my wonderful colleague Liv Cooper who also works on the Translocation Project that we run at Birds Paul Harbour and she's also our project coordinator. So what you have here is a font of Osprey knowledge. So what we're going to try and do over the next hour, half an hour, we can't guarantee how long this is going to go on for, we're going to try and impart to you as much of our Osprey knowledge as we possibly can. Um, so thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoy the talk. And without further ado, I'll let Liv take it away. Brilliant. Thanks, Brittany. Um, make sure we've got our tech working. Perfect. So we're going to kick off the talk with a bit of a background to Birds of Paul Harbour, um, just to introduce you, because we imagine there's quite a few people joining from across um, the country, not just Paul Harbour, this evening. Um, and then we'll go into an introduction to ospreys, give you a bit of background to their biology um, and their ecology. We'll quickly talk about translocation and what that means. And then, really importantly and excitingly, we're going to talk about the project process um, and what we progress and what we can expect to see um, this year and the coming years ahead. There will be a bit of time for questions at the end, so if you use the live chat box um, next to next to the screen, and um, put any questions you've got in there, and me and Brittany will try. There shouldn't be too many questions between us we can't cover, um, <laughs> hopefully, um, but we'll try and answer any questions you've got. So Birds of Paul Harbour themselves, we're um, a very small charity that are um, down in Paul Harbour, um, and we started in 2013, kind of fueled on obsession with bird life and teaching people about bird life in Paul Harbour, um, with the primary goals of kind of imparting knowledge about um, the conservation, the observation and the education of bird life in Paul Harbour. And we spend a lot of um, time trying to work with the public and engage them with what we've got going on here, which is part of what we're trying to do tonight, because we're in the midst of a really exciting project um, that we want to enthuse everyone about. Paul Harbour itself is just nestled on the south coast in lovely Dorset, um, kind of nice to nestle between the Isle of Wight and Portland Bill. Um, and we're in a prime location um, for both Ospreys but lots of other conservation projects as well. So as a charity, this, this is um, slightly dated this map, but as a charity we generally work within this Paul Harbour recording area and we um, conduct most of our project work and monitoring work in this area. So we're at lots of landowners um, and different charities, different projects around the harbour area um, and then try and also engage with people in this area as well. We have a very split and divided um, area in Paul Harbour. We have lots of um, conurbation and urban areas where you can see wildlife. I think places like Holmes Bay and Beta Park are really important, just as important um, as this, um, the seagrass beds in Stubland Bay um, to over at RSPB Arm, which is well known for its um, wildlife and nature, but got a special protection area in Pool Harbour. Lots of um, different important protections are given to Pool Harbour because of the huge number of birds that come here in the winter. And we really hope that in the future, part of that protection will be for the ospreys that will be in Pool Harbour as well. So we're in a perfect location for conservation projects just had um, recently announced in the last couple of years, um, the Purbeck Heaths NNR, a super nature reserve, 
running along from Studland, and it's going to be absolutely fantastic. That we've got such a, fun, a a great project happening that's you know got a high impact across the country just on our doorstep. Um, but we're also in the epicentre of lots of reintroduction projects. So we're really excited to be so closely related to the White-tailed Eagle project, which is taking place on the Isle of Wight. It's very similar to the Osprey Translocation project. It's led by the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation um, and also Forestry England. Um, but it is having impact in Pool Harbour as well. In the last couple of weeks, we've seen white-tailed eagles coming over. Myself and Brittany were on a boat yesterday and we saw two eagles from the boat, which was just amazing. We, ho we went out hoping to see ospreys, came back with eagles, which we're not saying they're any better, <laughs> better than <laughs> ospreys, but it's not what lots of people expect to see on the south coast. Um, it is what we should expect to see on the south coast. Um, back in 1780, um, white tail eagles last bred on Culver Cliffs on the Isle of Wight. And these, these birds do belong down here, just like ospreys. Um, it's unfortunately due to human persecution that these birds aren't here anymore and it's absolutely prime feeding location for them. We've had them fishing out the harbour in the last last week or so. Um, but you know, also hunting things like cuttlefish off the Isle of Wight. It's just fantastic. We, we expect to see these birds up in the highlands but it is no, no means the only place for them to exist. So we're very excited to have that just around the corner. We're also very, very hopefully going to be getting beavers in Pool Harbour in the next year or so, keeping our fingers crossed on the um, DEFRA consultation that's been going in the last year. Um, hopefully the beavers will be released at Little Sea at Studland, um, which is a freshwater area at Studland, and hopefully from there the population will grow. It will be um, a wild release, which would be very, very exciting. These, these, these animals are ecosystem engineers, they impact our whole landscape. Um, they impact our river systems, increasing the health of our um, river systems, but have a cascading effect on other wildlife in our area as well. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that we could have white-tailed eagles, we could have beavers, and of course, ospreys, all in Pool Harbour um, and breeding in Pool Harbour in the next few years. What an exciting prospect that is going to be. Um, we would love to talk to you more about all of those projects, but... Obviously, the one that we know best is the ospreys. So what I'm going to do now is talk you through the species itself, the, the legend that is the osprey. This is a lovely picture taken by local photographer Mark Wright of a very special bird who we're going to talk to you about a bit later. But I just want to talk to you a little bit about ospreys as a species um, and what their specialism is, because they are quite a unique species, actually. So ospreys are a large bird of prey, they're a raptor, they are quite unique within that, um, within the phylogeny. Um, genetically they are quite diverse from most other raptor species, part of what makes them really special. They are also quite unique in that they are what we call exclusively piscivorous, so that means they only eat fish. Um, they get everything they need from it, they get all their water, they get all their nutrients, everything comes from the fish. And that means they have a number of very special adaptations to do that. So you can see those enormous long talons on the feet of that bird there. Those are for catching and gripping onto the fish. The feet themselves are really scaled. They're very, very rough for gripping onto very uh, wriggly, scaly fish. Um, and at even, they have, they have four toes and the outer one on the front can actually reverse in order to get a better grip on the fish. And that's called being facultatively zygodactylic, which you don't need to remember, but I think it's a great little phrase. Ospreys are, we call them a very cosmopolitan species actually, they have a very widespread distribution globally. Um, there's a number of different ways of living as ospreys, so one of those is native resident, so that means birds that are sitting in one place all year round, living over the winter and then in the summer they're breeding in the same place. And there's a few places where they do that, like the Caribbean um, and also in the Australasian population, there's a number of, of uh, small subpopulations that do that. But actually, the majority of ospreys in the world are migratory. Um, there's really considered to be four different subpopulations or subspecies, sorry, of ospreys. Um, the one that we're going to be focusing on today is the European osprey. Um, and this is a bird that's breeding in Europe in East, uh, Western Asia, Northwestern Asia, 
in that area up in Scandinavia and then migrating down into West Africa. This is an example of that migration route. This um, is data from the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation who, like Liv mentioned before, partner in the Eagle project but also a partner in our osprey translocation project as well. And this is a typical route of an osprey that's migrating from the population up in Scotland down into West Africa. Um, ospreys are quite unique as well amongst birds of prey in that they can fly quite effectively over water. So in many individuals this route might vary, it might cross over the Bay of Biscay to the west of France, they might cross over parts of the Mediterranean, but this bird, like many other birds, has chosen to go across the Strait of Gibraltar, crossing that narrowest point into Africa. It's a quite a staggering journey. For most birds, it's going to be about 5,000 kilometres each way, and they do this each and every year. Um, much like many, many other migratory birds, it's still something that we're learning a lot about, um, and it, I think for all of us, we find it especially fascinating uh, learning about their migrations. And migration is very relevant at the moment. So here in Pool Harbour today, we had our first osprey sightings of the year. We, in fact, we had three different reports of ospreys, whether that's maybe one or two different individuals, we're not sure. Um, but what we're seeing at the moment is the spring osprey migration. So they're leaving their wintering grounds in West Africa. They're heading up to their breeding grounds. In the case of the birds passing through uh, Pool Harbour, they're most likely to be up in Scotland, Northern England, maybe over at Rutland Water or even Wales as well. So we get loads and loads of birds coming through Pool Harbour. And if you're like us and you're going to be out watching for ospreys during that time, we really want to be able to pick out the details on the individuals. When you're watching ospreys, it's brilliant to just enjoy them, but if you can get some information about them as well, that is really, really excellent. So we thought we'd give you a little quick ID course on ospreys. So the main thing to look out for, something that you might be able to see easily from a photograph that you've taken, um, is telling between the different sexes. So on the left here, we have a, an adult male osprey. Um, and what you can see is that compared to the female, the bird on the right, it is much less marked in the underwing. So the females have got this delicate speckling under in the white patch under the front of the wing. Um, and the males, although there is some overlap, males generally have a pa much paler patch in that area. You'll also notice that the breast band, so the area just around what we recognise as the neck of the bird, that is much, much darker in a lot of females. Again, there is a lot of overlap between that. Um, and if you're lucky enough to see but two birds together, you will be able to notice in most cases that the females are actually bigger than the males as well. So these are all really good things to be keeping an eye out for when you're watching birds. Even better if you're photographing them, you can get them home on the computer and you can look at the images like this. All of those things I've just described are um, a bit more tricky to tell between juvenile birds. So when we get to in Pool Harbour, talking about late August, early September, we're going to start seeing chicks that were born this year leaving their, uh, their natal grounds up in Africa, uh, sorry, up in Scotland, heading to West Africa or maybe the Mediterranean to overwinter for the first time. They will be passing through Pool Harbour and we'll be keeping an eye out for them. Um, in terms of uh, gendering them, sexing them, it's very difficult. However, there are the, some of those similarities you can see um, but to the adults. What's much easier to do is actually to distinguish them from the adults. So you'll notice in both of these individuals, there's almost like a, an orange tinge to a lot of the white feathering. And that's very, very typical of, of juvenile birds. They'll molt out those feathers when they become adults and they'll get that lovely crisp, dark brown colour and very bright white. But as a younger bird, they almost look a bit dirty. And that's probably originates from their, you know, wanting to be camouflaged in the nest. And that's also true of the backs of the birds as well. So this is a detail you can pick out from a really long way away. Because the juveniles have got this beautiful scalloping, each of the feathers on the back has this beautiful cream fringe on it. And what that allows you to do um, from a distance is n notice whether a bird is looking a lot paler than another bird nearby. So the adults have this beautiful plain chocolate brown on the back. Whereas the, the juvenile's just as gorgeous, but they've got this much lighter patterning to them. And even when you're looking from 500 metres, a kilometre away, sometimes you can still pick out those details. So that's a really, really good thing to look out for. 
As Brittany mentioned, um, we had the first osprey sightings in Paul Harbour today, but actually there are birds back on their nest already. Um, there's quite a few pairs back at Rutland, I believe, and then um, plenty up in Scotland as well. I think we're still waiting on our first um, Welsh returners to any of the nests there, but there's this big movement of them coming through at the moment, which started a few weeks ago. So ospreys typically return back to the UK in March um, through April, um, but that is adult ospreys. So we do have a slight delay on younger birds that aren't quite um, mature yet. In fact, um, up to two years old, they'll stay in their wintering grounds over winter um, and over summer before, before they're ready to return back to the UK at two years old or even three year old, years old for some of them. So they'll return back to the UK um, at about this time and they'll make their way um, up to their nesting grounds. But on the way, they'll have lots of stopover locations and Pool Harbour is a prime stopover location, which is the birds that we're seeing today, they were unringed. So we know they're not, not um, any of the birds that you may become familiar with in Pool Harbour um, because they haven't got a ring on their leg. We can't identify them. So it's very likely that they're birds going up to Scotland um, for the summer. They might be going to um, a breeding site there or just going to explore um, around a territory they might be looking for in Scotland. The birds that do have a nest will be racing back because um, ospreys are very attached to um, nests that are established. They like to use nests. Um, for, for birds that, tra that travel 5,000 kilometres a year they're quite lazy in the fact that they like to reuse nests each year and keep going back to the same one. And there will be competition for those nests every year. They also tend to be monogamous, so they tend to keep the same mates, but there are competition for mates as well. So if a bird doesn't arrive back quickly enough, um, they will change over. Um, and if a bird doesn't return back again, they will, they will go for another, another partner if, um, if there's no other options. So what they'll do is they'll race back and as immediately as they come back to the UK and come back to their nest, um, they'll start mating. And it's actually amazing how prompt these birds are, they usually return within a couple of days of the same day every year, um, which is remarkable considering how far they're travelling. And they'll come back and they'll be bringing in sticks to the nest, they'll be repairing any damage that's happened over the winter. Um, and as a result of this, the nest grows each year. Some of these, these um, nests are getting really, really large, not only in width, but in depth. Um, they can get to the size of a double bed and they're absolutely <laughs> huge. Um, so some of those really old Scottish nests that have been going since the 80s or before, they, they, are, they are ginormous um, and they pose a real risk to the trees. So a lot of the work that the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation do is going around those nests and um, putting in braces for those trees to make sure that they don't collapse because those ospreys, they're really dedicated to those nesting sites. Um, so at this stage, they'll keep mating for about two weeks um, until they do um, lay eggs. So they'll usually lay a clutch of three eggs, sometimes we do get four, um, and sometimes two instead, but typical clutch size is three. And they'll be incubated for about 37 days. At this point, the males and the females do take turns um, with incubating, but it is largely the females that do so. The male at this point is solely responsible um, for doing all the hunting, both for the female, but also for the chicks when they hatch. So, Britons can't say they're cute. They're <laughs> They're, um, they're, they're an interesting chick. Um, some people refer to them affectionately as bobbleheads because they just can't keep their head up. They're so fragile at this stage. The, the osprey egg is actually not that much bigger than the size of a hen's egg. Um, so when you consider the size of the bird having a 1.5 metre wingspan by the time they um, make their first migration, that is a real marked difference. Um, and you can think about how much dedication the male must be doing to bring in all that fish during that time. It's really down to the female to protect the nest at this point because these birds are very vulnerable to the heat, to the cold um, and to um, predators as well. Um, I've seen things like pine martin take eggs from nests. Um, you know, we've got an increasing number, very thankfully, of goshawk in the UK. Um, but that can sometimes set, set, uh, <laughs> set us on edge because we've seen videos um, from other countries of goshawks just swooping in and taking very large osprey chicks from nests but we'd be in a fantastic position if we had ospreys breeding enough for goshawk to be able to take, to take um, chicks from the nest. But the male will be hunting several times a day during this period to provide for the chicks. Um, the eggs are laid staggered, so they're usually around three days apart, and they will hatch at that rate as well. 
um, which gives each a little bit of buffer time to um, be fed up um, and have that really crucial vulnerable time at different, different stages and it gives them a little bit more protection. At about the age of six or seven weeks they start to do wing stretching um, and this behaviour known as helicoptering which if you've watched any Osprey webcams before it's very, very nerve-wracking because some of these nests are 50 foot up a tree um, in Scotland and some very tall Scots pines trees and these birds are hovering just, just above the nest and then dropping down because they need to practice um, and strengthen their wing muscles but also their legs as well. Ospreys tend to not be very good at landing which is something we experience in the project so um, they need to practice that behaviour before taking the, um, the plunge off the nest. I just want to say something about this picture. This picture was taken um, was it 15 years ago? How long ago? Hugh, Hugh Miles is a, a local photographer who um, was up in Scotland um, just when they were having the first few nests back in Scotland and it's just stunning, I think, um, that he managed to get these. But I really like this, that there's actually two chicks in the nest. You don't notice the little one tucked away and that just emphasises how nicely camouflaged they are um, with that lovely scalloping that Brittany was saying about. So they fledge at about seven to eight weeks of age, but they don't leave immediately on migration. They'll stay around for another four to six weeks, um, still completely reliant on the male. So he'll be constantly providing fish still at this point. Um, they'll be returning back to the nest um, to receive that fish from the male. They might occasionally make nest um, fishing attempts themselves, um, but rarely is it successful. So they're not even being taught by the male, they're just solely relying on him to provide the fish and build up their fat reserves before they leave on their first migration. The female will leave at this point. Um, she won't stay around until until the chicks have left. She'll um, leave on the migration. So we see a lot of birds come through the harbour in August and usually they'll normally all be female and there'll be fe female migrants coming back through after breeding. There's no responsibility that for them to be at the nest anymore and protecting those chicks. And a few weeks later, um, the juveniles will start to come through, along with the males as well. This is a really, really critical point, and so what the translocation project hinges on is the fact that they spend this four to six weeks imprinting on the local area. Ospreys display, display a behaviour known as natal phylopatry, so that means that they like to return to where they fledged from to breed. So they have to spend a lot of time taking in that local area memorising it and mapping it out so they can make their way back there a couple of years later um, for their own breeding attempt. And we know that this happens after fledging, so um, we'll talk a bit about this later when we talk about translocation, but that's absolutely critical um, that they learn that. It's particularly in the males that um, that drive is, is present, so it's a really critical period for them before they leave on their first migration. Typically, um, ospreys in their first year, there's only about 30% 30, 30 um, survival rate in young ospreys, which is extremely low. So um, building up the fat reserves at this point is incredibly important. Um, and yeah, it, it is a rough time for them, isn't it? Mm. So what Liv's given you there is a really lovely overview of the osprey year. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is a bit of history of ospreys in the UK because what we're trying to do here is explain to you why the translocation is necessary um, as, a, as a conservation tool for this species and why it's a really powerful tool to use for this species. And then Liv's done a really good job of illustrating some of those points you hear. Um, but we should probably start at the beginning with this. So this is a lovely old drawing um, by John Gould. I'm not even sure which book this came from. I found it on the internet. Is it, they've exaggerated some of the features of the osprey there, the, the legs aren't quite that blue. Um, but this and many other historical records have given us a really good idea of the history of the species in, in this country and abroad as well. Um, I've put mullet hawk up on the side there, that is the old Dorset and Hampshire name for osprey. And we're talking two or three centuries ago, um, this would have been a bird that was at one time widespread across the UK. And the only reason that they're not anymore, like Liv mentioned with the white-tailed eagles, is because of human persecution. Um, they were really heavily targeted. Um, I mean, the fact that they are a fish eater really is the what led to their demise. So ospreys were seen as a real pest, essentially. They would take fish um, from monastery ponds, 
um, from from very large wealthy houses. They would basically pillage the, the stocks of fish that were so important to people during, for example, the Middle Ages. As they became scarcer due to this persecution, alongside things like habitat loss as well, deforestation in the Industrial Revolution, um, they, they became scarcer and scarcer. And as a product of that, they became viewed as more and more valuable for trophy hunting. And also the thing that really led to their final demise was egg collecting. And you saw those beautiful eggs that Liv showed a picture of just now. That Those were considered incredibly desirable by egg collectors. And um, eventually in uh, 1916, the last breeding pair um, were wiped out from Scotland. Um, the eggs were collected the following year and no breeding was recorded after that for a period of about... 40 years. There may have been some going on, um, but we we don't really have any records of that. Um, if you consider that the two world wars took place during that period, it probably wasn't a priority for recording species activities like that. So we do have a bit of a gap in the knowledge there. Um, but what was really fantastic is that the species didn't give up without a fight. Um, and some of you may know this site. I've not actually had the privilege of going to this site. But this is Loch Garten up in Scotland, and this is really where the return of the osprey um, and that story begins. So natural recolonisation was um, actually the thing that saved this species in the UK. Um, it was in 1954 that a pair established a nest at Loch Garten, a uh, site run by the RSPB up in Scotland in the Cairngorms National Park. And at the time, obviously being the only breeding pair in the country, it was incredibly an incredibly sensitive site and it was very well protected. I should say that these two birds were probably Scandinavian birds. Some individuals do uh, disperse occasionally, particularly females, but occasionally males do disperse a long way as well. Um, and we call those individuals, individuals pioneering individuals, the ones that are responsible for establishing new populations. And that's what this pair became. They became responsible for re-establishing the British osprey population. But as I said, that was an incredibly sensitive thing to have a single pair of the species in the whole of the country. And over the course of a few years, a very dedicated group of people worked very hard to try and protect that pair because some of the threats that had led to their decline were still existing. So in particular, egg collecting was still ongoing. And over the course of the next five years or so, a number of failed breeding seasons occurred due to at least attempts at egg collecting. And that was very sad. But what was done, and this has really kind of become the foundation for the conservation of the species as a whole, not just in this country, but elsewhere, is that the gentleman who was in charge at the time at this site, George Waterston, a gentleman who I hope some of you have heard of, he made a really what was quite a bold decision, which was to open up the viewing of this site to members of the public. And like I said, as the only nest in care, that is quite a really bold decision and one that was quite heavily criticised at the time um, for maybe being not, not a wise one and could have been very risky and could have led to the, once again, the loss of the species. But instead what happened was that members of the public, people came from far and wide to see this breeding pair. And in doing so, they actually became custodians of the nest. They watched the pair grow, they learnt about the species, they learnt to care about the species that had been missing from the landscape for so long. Some of you might recognise this chappie on the left. That is a young Roy Dennis in his early 20s, playing a crucial role in showing that species to the members of the public. And I'm really happy to say that everything that's happened since then on the whole has been very, very positive for this species. So the population grew very considerably. Um, in Scotland, there, we now estimate that there are over 300 breeding pairs. Um, and the reason we can make estimates like that is because since very, very early days in the, in the 60s, they started a monitoring programme for the species, um, which involved attaching rings to the legs of birds. So we've got two different types of rings here. The one that the 
bird is being fitted with there, the metal one, that is a BTO ring, that's the British Trust for Ornithology, um, and that has a unique num alphanumeric code on it, that it, should that bird ever be recovered, either dead or alive, they can read that ring and they know exactly which individual that was, and they have a life history information for it. The reason that they add a Darvik ring, this is a plastic ring with just a, a shorter code on it, is because that can be viewed in the field without recapturing the bird, which, speaking as someone who's, who's worked with people who have caught adult ospreys in the field before, it's not an easy thing to do. So if you can identify an individual without having to recapture it, that is a really, really good thing. So the Darvik wings help us to do that, and when you hear us referring to individuals, we'll often be referring to the codes on those leg rings. So the population grew really, really encouragingly. Like I said, the, the Scottish population was doing really well, but the species was still confined to those areas of the highlands of Scotland and quite remote areas. Um, and really that was very, very isolated for it, isolated from the rest of the populations in Scandinavia and, and in Central Europe. So the decision was made to trial uh, a tr conservation technique which had been tried in the US but never in Europe, um, and that was the translocation method, which we're going to talk more to you about in a moment. Um, the site that was selected was Rutland Water, which is in the Midlands, um, to one of the largest inland reservoirs in all of Europe, I think. And they get a lot of migrant ospreys, lots of Scottish birds passing over there each spring and autumn. They knew that the site was suitable for ospreys there, and so the decision was made to take Scottish-born chicks, move them down to Rutland Water, and then release them. And then they would learn, like Liv said, to imprint on that area. And that was really, really successful. So that led to the establishment of the population at Rutland, which now is really nine or ten pairs per year, depending on the year, um, which is probably roughly what the area can sustain. That population probably isn't likely to grow and expand too much more within that core area. Um, the first breeding was in 2001, uh, which was actually joint first breeding with, uh, there was another pair that bred at Bassenthwaite, which is up in the Lake District. That was the two first osprey breeding events in England since 1847. So that was really, really wonderful. Quite an unexpected result of the Rutland translocation was the establishment of the Welsh population as well. So two of the males that were translocated to Rutland Water actually dispersed all the way across into Wales and both established breeding nests there. The nest that you can see here is the Glaslin nest um, near Snowdonia National Park. And this nest has been occupied by ospreys every year since 2004. And in fact, by the same breeding female every single year since 2004. So that um, was a really, really unexpected outcome, but a very, very positive one from the Rutland Translocation Project. And Wales is now approaching a very healthy population of ospreys as well. This is just a rough... Um, rough map of where some of those nests are. We don't know where all of the nests are, not all of the nests are in the public domain, but that gives you kind of an idea of what the growth of the population has been like over the last 20 years in England and Wales. And that's really, really encouraging, but what you will notice is that those populations are still quite isolated and not that big. Um, and that kind of makes more sense when you see it in the context of the European population as a whole. You can see those populations up in Scandinavia, northern Russia, those areas are the refugia for the population. Those are where they weren't persecuted, they weren't wiped out over the last few centuries. That's where they persisted, and now they're slowly dispersing down into those other areas. But for the reasons that Liv described, the natal filipatry, and also something called conspecific attraction, which is where individuals only like to breed in areas where there's other ospreys, this process of spread is very, very slow. Um, and that's why the translocation method is so important. And it's been trialled not only in the UK now, but also in France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Switzerland, um, with more probably to come in the coming decade. So this, this method is being really used to really fantastic effect. Um, there are other methods you can use, um, and it's always worth giving these things a go before translocation because although it is just another conservation tool, it is um, quite an expensive one, quite a uh, one that takes a lot of effort and input. 
Um, something that's very easy to do and lots of people have done all along the south coast, including here in Pool Harbour, is to put up artificial osprey nests. Um, I love these pictures. This is from the RSPB reserve down at Arne. This is Mark Singleton, who used to be the reserve manager there. Um, and this was done in partnership with Roy Dennis. And this was actually back in 2006. So this is long before we were talking about translocating ospreys to Pool Harbour. Uh, 2009, sorry, um, I'll correct myself. Um, there were lots of birds passing through Pool Harbour, just like so many other places in the country. This is a really, really good place for ospreys. Um, it's so shallow, there's so much good water here for the birds. Um, we knew that birds were passing through. Could we encourage them to breed? Sadly, not even polystyrene ospreys were enough to encourage them to enter the area. So that's when translocation becomes a very important tool. Just realised that we um, didn't plug our laptop in to the, <laughs> to the power and it just flashed up with your battery is going to run out. So <laughs> it can be two of us, but we can still... <laughs> forget things. Yeah, we can forget things. But as Brittany was saying, translocation um, comes after lots of other work put in first to try and encourage um, species to come back to an area naturally. What translocation gives you the benefit of is speeding up that process to create a more robust population. Because when you've got those very fragmented, isolated populations, for example, the ones we've got in Rutland or in Wales, and even the 300 nests that we've got in Scotland, if you have a really poor wave of weather or um, any sort of incidents in that area that could impact a large number of nests, because it's such a fragile population already, um, you can wipe out an entire, an entire population and take us back down um, to the really, really low numbers again in a very small space of time. So what we want to do is make a robust population with those stepping stone um, groups, build it across, um, back onto the continent, um, so we've got that um, wider population that will be more robust to any problems that we might have in the future. Plus, it's absolutely fantastic. We've got so many people excited about ospreys down here when they're passing through our migration. Isn't it fantastic that we can consider the fact that we can have breeding here once again due to a relatively simple um, process because we understand the ecology of these birds. So we'll talk a bit about the process of translocation. Um, the team here um, are the team that we've got working on the project at the moment. Um, myself and Lucy, Lucy's just on the end in um, the blue top, we joined the project in 2019. Um, Brittany and Paul, who is one of the trustees and founders of um, Birds of Paul Harbour, um, they've been working on the project since the beginning and um, they have a very, very strong affiliation with the project, they're absolutely obsessed, <laughs> um, which when me and Lucy joined, we soon learned to adopt, so um, we absolutely love it. But we're standing here in front of the osprey pens, which gives you a bit of a scale um, as to as to what sort of how the project looks in the summer. We're not working alone, we have a um, very strong relationship with the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation, who are a partner in the project, and they have a team up in Scotland who are responsible for collecting the chicks and monitoring the nest, which starts um, a number of months before the work, the hard work for us starts down here. So typically the Osprey project itself will start in mid-July, um, but prior to that, Roy and his team will be going out monitoring for months several nests um, that are around Scotland um, that Roy, well, Roy's been monitoring for the last 50 years up there, and he knows where those sustainable populations are, where it's safe and secure to take um, chicks from for translocation which won't damage the population. It's a really healthy number of birds in that area. Um, we want to try and incre increase productivity for ospreys up in Scotland as well as down here. There is um, that natal phylopatry, bringing birds back to the same area means that eventually the area will get saturated. Um, and that very slow progression means that there's birds that are waiting around to breed in some areas. So we want to try and help that dispersal by bringing birds down here um, but also spreading those ones out from Scotland as well. So what we do for collecting the chicks is um, some very skilled tree climbers um, <laughs> go up to nests in Scotland, they'll be monitoring the nests, as I said before, um, and they'll know how many chicks are in each nest. When, once they're about the age of um, seven weeks, we'll consider them for being down for translocation. And we will generally, we'll talk a bit more about this later, but generally um, go towards bringing more males down than females for the project. What they'll do is they'll bring them down from the nest and they'll take all the chicks down from the nest and they'll be ringed. So Brittany mentioned earlier with those Darvik and the BTO rings that are put on their legs. Um, but then 
number of the birds will be placed back in the nest. So usually we'll only take one individual from a nest, sometimes two, if there's um, a larger clutch. Um, but we'll always leave a bird for the parents um, to come back to. And what we'll do in the project is we'll take the strongest birds from the nest, the ones that are more um, resilient for coming down to Pool Harbour, because it is quite a long journey for them. Um, but it gives the younger and the slightly sometimes weaker birds a better chance of survival because often um, we'll have individuals that will die in natural nests um, because they're maybe not getting enough food or being outcompeted by stronger individuals because it is such hard work for the male to provide enough food. Um, it's a really intense time for both the chicks and the adults on the nests. So we, we do select for the stronger birds because it gives the, the weak ones a better chance of survival because they're getting the sole attention of the parents at that point. Um, so it's increasing productivity in that way. So those strong birds are then transported down to Pool Harbour um, in the back of an Enterprise van. <laughs> so it's a very glamorous trip down to them and at that point they're transferred overnight so it's nice and cool and they're brought back down in boxes. So they just kind of lie down in the boxes, it's nice and dark for them and they're fed and monitored regularly on that journey. And when they get down there they're um, put straight into these um, hacking pens which are release pens. They're so similar to ones that are used in falconry. Um, in, inside the pens we've got a lovely perching bar which in this picture is absolutely covered in osprey um, excrement. <laughs> um, but we also have a, um, a perching post and um, an artificial nest in the corner which is where they receive their food. And we try to limit human contact with them as much as possible from this point on. We don't want these birds to become habituated to humans at all. Um, in fact, ospreys, they, they don't like humans, so there's, there's not a good chance of that. But um, they, they respond well to this environment because they've got a very similar situation to what they've got in the nest. They've got some siblings which they readily, even though they're not their own siblings, readily adopt as being, um, being their, their siblings in the pens. Um, there is a couple of hours or a day or so where they adjust to the hierarchy within within the pen. Sometimes we might have to adjust that if we've got a particularly um, um, brutal bird in one pen and it, it kind of need to um, adjust that slightly, but, but um, it usually settles after a day or so. And what it's our job to do is to monitor the birds and um, ensure that they're staying healthy and are developing, developing in the way they want, but also to feed them. So it's mine and Brittany's job to provide a lot and lo a lot of fish um, during this time. So they're, they're usually in the pens for one to two weeks. Um, in 2019, we, we prepared half a ton of fish during the course of the project, um, which is a lot of fish to prep. And we do that um, inside. It used to be in a caravan, which um, <laughs> I think got very fishy and very smelly. Fortunately, in 2019, um, we got this lovely prep, prep room, um, which means that we got yeah a really fantastic space for prepping the fish. And we monitor them via CCTV in the pens. Um, so what we do in that time, using the CCTV, um, is just check, we're looking out for any behaviours, any signs of development, that wing flapping, that helicoptering we see in the pen, um, looking out for any signs of ill health as well, because we want to ensure we can um, make sure that all these birds are in top top, tip top condition, um, getting ready to fledge for the first time. And we'll be feeding them three times a day, so um, there's a little hatch that what we're looking for in this picture is the hatch that we've got at the back of the pen. We'll be cautiously <laughs> sliding in um, fish three times a day through that hatch, um, where at the start of the project they're, they're very cautious as well, they're a hand back um, and they're trying to work out what's going on but by the time they're ready to be released they are fully in, they're, they're vicious, they're, they're vicious. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they'll be pouncing on, on, your own, on the food as soon as you put it in, they'll be jabbing, they'll be stabbing, they're doing whatever they can do um, to try and ward you off which is exactly what we want to see because we don't want them to be happy, happy to see us at all. Um, so it's a lot of a lot of um, effort for us at this point. We want to be really rigorous, rigorous in our methods. We want to make sure that nothing's going wrong at this stage, um, and these birds are, are behaving as we want them to. So Liv mentioned there that one of the things we're looking at really quite closely is their their wing flapping and then basically undergoing the process of learning to fly, and. This is a bit of a milestone for, for them, so this is something that we really, we have a number of different milestones that they go through during their development, 
And flying is a really crucial one because we know that once they make that first flight, and usually that first flight is going to be, they stand on the edge of the nest, they start by doing that helicoptering behaviour that Liv described before, the, the wild nesting birds, and then eventually they pluck up the courage to try and fly onto the perch. And once they do that, there's a, quite a marked change in their behaviour. So these two individuals are actually sat quite close together for two birds that have learnt to fly, because often at this point, you will find them sat at opposite ends of the perch. They're not, I mean, they're not sociable birds at the best of times, but at this point they become really, really indifferent to each other and they spend most of their time looking out into the surrounding landscape. And at that point, once they've made that flight, we know that within the space of a week, they will probably be ready to be released. But there's something really important we have to do before we release them, and that is to fit them with a radio tag. Um, radio tags are one of the least spatially accurate methods of tagging a bird, but they're not too expensive, um, and also they're very lightweight. So the tags that we're fitting to these birds, they literally only weigh a couple of grams, 2.45 grams is the exact measurement, and what they, we do with those is we slide them onto the central tail feather of the bird, um, and all that is, it's just a tag with an aerial on it, and it, each bird has a unique frequency tag. And what that allows us to do is to track the direction that the bird is in, and based on the strength of the signal, it's just a beep, 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 um, we can usually work out how far away the bird might be. And that has been such a crucial tool for us over the years when monitoring these birds. So once we've taken them out for tagging, we do them one at a time. Often we'll fit them with a falconry hood, which just covers their eyes, puts them in the dark a bit. They kind of, a bit like chickens, they don't quite go to sleep, but it massively calms them down. And then we're hand, handling each bird for often less than 10, 15 minutes. And that's really crucial, again, minimising that contact time that they have with us. We then put them back in the pens, give them the rest of the day to settle back in. And then often the following morning, we will go and release them. And that's what this looks like. So you can see the front of the pens there. This is footage from inside each pen. The front of the pens opens, much like an oven door. And then we do that as slowly and steadily as possible. And then we sneak away from the pens as quietly as possible. Often we army crawl on the floor to get away if there's a bird nearby that might see us. And then we retreat away. And the aim is for the birds to be able to leave the pens when they themselves are ready to do so. Um, we don't want to flush them out, scare them out, because that's when things might go wrong. So that was a clip there of one of the birds making that first little flight, and that was perfect. That's exactly what you want them to do. Make a first little flight out onto the front of the pens, and then eventually they'll move off elsewhere. And that's when the outdoor monitoring part of our job comes around. So you can see Liv on the left there. She's got the what we call the Yagi and the Seeker. This is the radio tracking equipment and it's an aerial and like I said it gives us an idea of which direction the birds are in and on occasion if a bird ends up on the ground for example, worst case scenario, can't take off again. Sometimes they land on a flimsy tree or one, one even landed on a gorse bush one year and just fell straight through to the bottom and we had to go and pick that bird up again because if we'd left it there it would have been vulnerable potentially to something like predation. So that radio tracking has saved the lives of a number of birds throughout the course of the project. But we're also monitoring them visually as well. So uh, that's me with a telescope. And often what we're doing with the telescopes is trying to read the leg rings of the birds and just checking on their general behavior. And often several times a day or several times an hour, depending on what period of the uh, project we're in, we will be going out and checking on each bird. Um, and that is <laughs> at times very difficult, but it's a really, really rewarding period of time because you get to see them at their best. Obviously, being in the pens, it's what's important for them. They need that time to acclimatise and to learn to fly. But once they've been released and once they're flying, they really are in their element, and it's such a joy to watch them during that period. And during that time, they're using lots of different areas. So the original translocation site that we used to use was down on the edge of Pool Harbour. And there was, um, mostly out in front of the pens, was a large area of salt marsh. Not many trees, not many, many natural perches for them, which is really what they prefer. So we had to put out a lot of these tea perches that you can see in the middle and the bottom there. Um, but really, the, the release site that we use now has a lot more natural perches around it, and they much, much prefer that. 
they like to be nice and high, prominent in the landscape, able to see what's going on around them. In the past, we've also put the food out on feeding nests. So what they do really is they associate the pens as being the home. That's like the natal nest site. So when they're expecting food or they're hungry, they are always coming back to that area. So we place a number of feeding nests out in front of the pens and uh, that's where they'll, they learn very quickly to come in there for food. But in recent years, we've actually started putting the food on top of the pens because that's just the first place they always go back to. And this is a clip of two of the birds from last year. This is actually a pair of siblings. This is 371 and 375. The bird on the left, some of you may have heard us talking about him. We, he was named by one of the team that collected him from Scotland as Wee Nippy um, because he was just that. He was one of the smallest chicks and he was very bitey. Um, he is a bit of a mad bird actually. He went missing for two days during the project this year. Um, we couldn't get a radio signal for him. We were worried about what had happened. He came back two days later, soaking wet, absolutely fine, moved on. No idea what happened to him there. He's a real fighter. We'd like to see <laughs> him back. Um, but what you'll notice from that video is the way that they were eating the fish. They're grabbing it with their talons and they're really tearing it. So when they're younger, the adult female will be tearing off tiny pieces just like they're doing and presenting it to them. But that's another real milestone for them. Once they learn to grip the fish like that and tear it themselves, um, they're good to go. They can really uh, feed themselves at that stage. That's another really encouraging milestone and something that they usually have to do before we release them. Um, they get through a lot of fish. So this is all very fresh trout from the local trout farm. We get it fresh every single day. We prepare it there and then. And it is it has everything, absolutely everything they need in it. Um, but they get through it very quickly with the help of the magpies. And uh, sometimes the, the old heron will drop in. Um, so it doesn't last very long. And at one point last year, I was ordering 10 kilograms of fish every single day for 10 birds. Um, and this is what happens when you don't feed them. <laughs> I'm hoping you can hear. <laughs> An absolute raucous, <laughs> ruckus of um, calls there. That is the food begging call, which hopefully we will hear some more of in the coming years here in Pool Harbour. Um, that is very, very typical behaviour of them. That is to get the attention of the adults and get the food from them. It gets our attention, but sometimes they've just got to wait till the next day and we go and do another fish pickup. We can't be waking up the fish farmer at seven o'clock in the evening saying, can we have more fish? So... Um... <laughs> There was one particular bird, well there's usually a couple of birds that um, particularly enjoy the fish. Um, and it's often the females, interestingly, that seem to be building up their reserves more than the males before they go on migration. They sometimes seem to leave a little bit later as well. Um, but this individual, 023, she was one of our um, 2019 cohort, which me and Brittany were really rooting for. Um, we affectionately nicknamed her the basketball because she absolutely stocked up on fish. She was coming in six or seven times a day um, for fish and staying there and eating it because some of these birds they're flying off and they're dropping fish and coming straight back in to get more but she would sit there for hours on end just feeding and constantly feeding um, until she was quite round and people might think why are we laughing at about a bird being overweight but it's actually really really important and um, they build up those fat reserves. In in the same year we had a bird we released um, 025 who unfortunately just prior to um, leaving on migration, was predated on the release site, which we expect was by a fox, um, which was really disappointing for all of us because we, we sent off, we managed to track down um, the body and send it off for a post-mortem. And that bird came back as in really, really good condition with the note of being morbidly obese, which we were very disappointed that we'd lost that bird, but it was fantastic to hear that he was in that condition because these birds have got to travel such a, uh, a long distance and birds like 023 weren't hunting for themselves. She was she was definitely not <laughs> hunting for herself because she was on the nest all the time eating the fish we were providing. So until that instinct instinct kicks in to fish for themselves when they're leaving on their migration, um, they've got to be working through those fat, fat reserves um, and it's our job. I, I mean, Roy talks about it enough, doesn't he? It's our job to just keep feeding these birds until they don't want anything else. Um, so yeah, it can get very loud when you're going down to do the feed because they're constantly calling. Even when they're full, they'll be constantly calling. Even when they've got fish in their talons. Yeah, be <laughs> it's, just con it's constant. Um, yeah. <laughs> and during this time, they'll be at the release site um, for a 
about four to six weeks since after we released them, just like they would be surrounding a natal nest in Scotland. Um, and they're mapping out that local area, they're imprinting just like we want them to. So hopefully, we're kind of tricking them to hopefully think that in a couple of years' time they'll return back to Pool Harbour instead of um, going to Scotland or wherever their nest was, um, which they were taken from, depending on where they're being translocated to. Um, so the birds that we're releasing, they're experiencing the Pool Harbour area and they're mapping it out. Um, and after a couple of weeks, they'll start to venture away from the release site. So we'll be constantly scanning with the Yagi um, throughout the day. And we'll start to get um, weaker signals through through the weeks. Um, and eventually we'll lose signals. So these birds will be travelling usually over four kilometres away from the release site, um, depending on what's in the way of the signal. Um, because you do get a weaker signal if you've got um, various things in the landscape that block the signal slightly. So we'll see that these birds will be going away for a couple of hours, but then returning back to the site. And during that time, they'll be exploring the local area, or they'll be pestering migrant adults that are coming through, um, as if we weren't fighting them with enough fish. <laughs> they'll be going and disturbing the birds that are fishing for themselves. Um, often they'll be seemingly watching the behaviour of these adults as well, which we think is important. It's, it's nice that they're getting that interaction with other birds and kind of learning where their place is in that because they'll be traveling down to their wintering grounds and they'll be needing to establish establish a territory when they do reach their wintering grounds so having that interaction is important we do a lot of boat trips in um in the summer in fact this year we're doing 30 osprey cruises previously the maximum we've done is 14 so it's going to be an intense summer um but what we do on these boat trips is we take out those y yagi scanners with us as well so we're monitoring away from the release site at this time and we'll be scanning um, and when we can see um, a juvenile bird because we usually you'll be able to tell them apart from the others because from their behavior um, so the they might be making um, diving attempts or they'll be kind of scanning and following around the adults in a bit slightly different behavior they're not very confident in their flight yet um, and we can often pick them out by that plumage difference as well so we'll then use the Yagi, we'll point it at the individual we can see, and we'll be able to pick up a signal and see which bird it might be from the release, released from the project. So we can see which birds have left yet, or which birds haven't, um, and some we even see while they're leaving the area. So this was one of the individuals back in 2019, which this was the last time it was picked up um, as, it was, as it was leaving Paul Harbour. It didn't come back to the release site later that day. Another brilliant photo by Mark. Um, yeah, absolutely stunning. So at this point, they'll leave on their migration, um, and that's our job done for the summer. So once they've all gone, sometimes they take us by surprise and go over two days and disappear and leave us with empty nests. And we're thinking, this is a bit ominous, really. You, you have 11 screaming individuals one day, and then the next day you have none at all. Um, but if the conditions are right, they'll just head, head straight on their migration, and that's exactly what we want them to do. And it will be another couple of years wait then until we see them come back to the UK. So we have a bit of a tense waiting period during that time where they're maturing in their wintering grounds, they're establishing a territory for themselves that they'll then return to every year following. Um, and that's actually a really interesting um, part of their, their life history as well. They, they spend a lot of time in their wintering grounds, um, which is a complete side that we don't get to see unless we get pictures sent through to us um, of recoveries, um, which is the visible of their leg rings and um, through, through photos, didn't put that very well, the visible photo, ah, <laughs> visible leg rings on photos that they get sent through to us um, so we can see where they're overwintering. And they'll move around during that first wintering period trying to establish a really good location for them to stay um, and develop before they're mature enough to return back to the UK. So Within the project so far, um, we started our application back in 2016, um, but in the first year we released eight birds, which is a fantastic year, um, and we'll talk a little bit about which birds we've seen and had information about since, since the project in a moment. Um, we did discuss, I'll just add these onto the screen, we did discuss earlier about having a slight weighting towards males um, over females, and that is because of that nasal phylopatry that is displayed um, by the males. We want to kind of draw those birds in to establish that population. As Brittany mentioned, conspecific attraction is really important. So having birds come to an area to then bring in more, more birds um, is really important. The females tend to wander a little bit more 
Um, so when they come back at age um, two years old, they'll come back to the UK and they'll explore a little bit and sometimes they'll be attracted into completely new areas by other populations. Um, and that, that really helps a lot of flexibility within the populations. That helps them, enables them to spread a bit better and um, create a bit of resilience and also um, switch up the genetics a little bit as well, which is really important. And um, that the males are very dedicated. So we do want females down for the project, but we do tend to um, lean towards males being brought down. Interestingly, they did the same thing up at Rutland um, for the project. They did, they did um, were biased towards males and then they found that they weren't getting enough females coming back for the project. So they did another year where they added on um, and released another... Do you know how many birds it was, Brittany? I don't know, oh, it's about ten. Another ten, ten birds, which were all female. Um, and they released them, and none of those individuals came back, um, but they've still got nine, ten breeding pairs there. So you just have a little bit of time. You've got that latency period, which you have to trust, and you will get these birds back to the area. It's, it's not a quick-fix project. It does take a lot of work and a lot of time. Um, going back to the timeline of the project, in 2018 released 14 birds, but it was it was a really difficult year for the project. It was, um, if you remember back to 2018, an extreme heat wave um, was that year, and we had a few complications with the project. We think the birds might have been slightly too young, some of the birds that were taken um, for the project that year, so we adjusted our methods um, for the project to, to reduce those risks basically because if we had a heat wave again we didn't want to be putting those birds at risk so we did lose a few birds in 2018. Um, so myself and Lucy joined the project in 20, 2019 and that year we released 11 birds and it was absolutely fantastic. We still had quite a bit of heat but the birds were a little bit older and we changed our release site as well and our fish suppliers and we had a fantastic season. Um, so finally, um, well actually we had 2021st, which was the year of COVID, where COVID pandemic started. Um, unfortunately, we were unable to run the project project that year, be, not because of COVID. We set up having lots and lots of um, meetings online to try and prepare for the project and see how we could set it up with social distinct, distancing me measures in place. There was one horrifying suggestion that we'd all be living in the same room um, for this, the, co the course of the project, um, which I think would have driven us all mad because we already get... Um, osprey brain during that time anyway um, but we weren't able to go through the project because it was a really poor breeding season that year and it's irresponsible irresponsible for us to take birds from nests where there aren't a sustainable there isn't a sustainable or healthy population that year um, we'll talk a little bit about it a bit more in a minute but there weren't enough um, chicks for us to take down from Scotland for the project at the right age um, for the project to run in 2020 so we had a missed out year um, and we got back on, back on track last year in 2021. Again, it was a bit of difficulty with the nests. We didn't have um, such high numbers of males in nests last year. So we had equal numbers of males and females and it was another brilliant year for the project. So what we're going to do now is talk to you about a few of the major successes as we view them from the project so far. Um, I'll get right into it with a bird that hopefully many of you will know the name of, um, <laughs> but a bird that actually originally had absolutely nothing to do with our project. So the bird that's trying to land on that perch there is an adult bird in amongst some juveniles. And this was on the 8th of August 2017. We were up on the hill at the original release site monitoring the release chicks. It was all going uh, swimmingly. We did a scan with the Yagi. Everyone was there. We could see all the birds out in front of us, we were counting, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We only released eight birds <laughs> in 2017. We knew there was an intruder somewhere and Tim McCrill, who was um, helping uh, guide us through the project at the time he was present on site, he was able to identify this individual that's landing as the intruder and he was able to read the leg ring and it was CJ7. Um, which is a bird that he actually ringed in the Rutland population back in 2015. So at this point, she was a two-year-old female. She was probably, she was definitely back in the UK for the first time. Um, she was probably, as young, many young birds do, particularly young females, she was being very nomadic, just exploring the whole of the country, basically, looking for other osprey populations, looking for potential future breeding opportunities. Um, she was in Pool Harbour. Why not? Pool Harbour is absolutely excellent for ospreys. 
there's lots of great habitat, there's lots of excellent food. Um, and she just happened to come across eight juvenile ospreys. Um, there she is, in case there's any doubt, that's CJ7. Um, and that encounter, I mean, like Liv was saying, it's great for the juveniles to come across adults, but that encounter was even more important for her because what it seems to have done is convinced her that there is a breeding, really healthy breeding population of ospreys in Pool Harbour. We've basically encouraged that conspecific attraction without actually even having breeding pairs here already. She's just been attracted into the area by the presence of juveniles. And that's probably a really, really important cue. You know, that shows successful breeding attempts have taken place. So she came back in 2018 and she was seen kind of on and off throughout the season, but she was definitely still present again at the end of the season. And we were really, really encouraged by this behaviour and we were wondering whether she would come back in 2019, um, which we knew would be the first time that we could expect to see any of our translocated juveniles come back because, like Liv said, those juveniles, uh, they spend two winters in West Africa, they become sexually mature, they come back for the first time. So we knew that from any time, April or May onwards in 2020, uh, 2019, sorry, we would be keeping an eye out for those translocated birds. Um, and would CJ7 be around as well? We were very interested to know. So in anticipation of all of this, we started deploying these motion sensitive cameras. So this is a nest that hopefully some of you might have visited in the past. This is the nest at Middlebeer. So you can view this from the RSPB Arn Reserve up on Coombe Heath. This is a nest that's been up for a number of years. Um, and on that arm on the right hand end there, you can see what is essentially just a camera trap. Um, it is just picks up motion, takes a photograph, um, but what's a bit different about it is that it's got a SIM card in it. So every two hours or so, it will send an image through directly to our phones. Um, you can get quite addictive. They come through at all hours. <laughs> um, you've probably seen us posting them on, on Twitter or Facebook as well. Um, but that is a really, really powerful and really quite a cheap tool for monitoring an area and working out what's going on and you know the reason we've put up all these artificial nests is um, that they're so successful often in uh, resident populations of ospreys and encouraging breeding is that but like Liv described ospreys like to use nests that have already been used by other birds or they've used in previous years so if they see a nest that looks like an osprey built it they'll be very keen to occupy it and if not just have a look at it um, Admittedly, we got a real variety of species on the camera. These are Egyptian geese. Uh, throughout the season, we had massive flocks of starlings on there as well. We even had the odd raptors, a lovely little kestrel there. Um, but by far, my favourite picture that we got through that year from the middle beer camera was this. This is CJ7 on the 1st of April. And this is really interesting in, a, in itself because that is a date that is very typical of a breeding individual returning uh, late March, early April, only the, you know, the keen breeding individuals come back at that time. And sure enough, within the space of a couple of weeks, she had actually started adding materials to those nests. She was displaying breeding behaviours without even having encountered uh, a, a mate, a potential mate, uh, or even another resident adult in the harbour. Um, so this, I mean, this totally blew us away. We were so, so encouraged. Um, and we were just waiting, really for another bird to turn up, and so was she. Sadly, the bird that turned up was this brute. This is a bird that we nicknamed Beaky, which may have been a mistake. Um, this is, she's probably one of the biggest females I've ever seen, and you can see from the size of that mullet that she's caught there, um, she's absolutely vast. That, But that fish probably weighed half of her body weight or something ridiculous. She is a real brute. She saw CJ7 off of that nest and actually CJ7 didn't go back to that nest more than once or twice for the rest of that season. Um, she really got scared off that nest by Beaky. Beaky stayed for a few weeks but then she went on elsewhere. We don't think she was a breeding individual um, because she didn't hang, she kind of came through a bit late to be heading back onto a nest. She didn't seem in any rush to go on somewhere else but she did move on eventually. Um, and it wasn't until a few months later, on the 12th of June, when we got some real excitement coming through. Uh, this is very typical of a image that we'll get through from our 
motion sensitive cameras initially they come through as low resolution and then we have to request a high definition image and actually at this point we couldn't get high definition images we could see two ospreys from a few of the other pictures we could see they were both ringed on the right leg and we thought we could make out maybe a few of those letters so our colleague Paul he dashed out tried to find the birds he managed to locate the bird but sadly it was facing the wrong way there was too much heat haze he couldn't read the leg ring and the pair flew off um, I should point out that there that is CJ7 she immediately found this individual and they were seen flying around together um, and Paul on his way home thought he'd just check one other artificial nest site before he headed on home and gave up trying to find this bird and thank goodness he found them and the individual was LS7 LS7 was a really, really strong male from the first year of the project. He was con consistently the first to hit various milestones, so he was the first to fledge. He was the first to leave on migration. Um, he was the first to come back, and he was also the first in uh, male osprey in Dorset for many, many years to be doing this, which is what we think was probably a crude attempt at a mating attempt. So often when they're mating, the males will land on the female's back. Um, doesn't look awfully comfortable for either of them. This is only, we could only get images through at this point. So this is what we think was going on. And that was a really, really encouraging behavior for us to be seeing and left us very, very hopeful for 2020. We were so hopeful, in fact, that we did a fundraiser um, to install a live stream camera on one of the Osprey nests. So. Um, you can see from those images that we provided before, there were a few different nests that we were taking pictures from. Um, so it was a bit of a risk putting a camera on one nest, um, and we were really, really hoping that it would pay off, because this could be the first breeding attempt in 200 years, and we wanted to tell the story and bring people along with it, because they're not our birds, they're not our birds at all, they're, they're wild birds, but they are part of the natural history of Dorset, of people of Pool Harbour, and it's exciting to be able to show people what's on their doorstep and what's happening as it happens. Um, a lot of the nesting sites have webcams on, but they're nests that have been established for years, um, and we wanted to show people what was happening in real time, um, which took the risk of if these birds didn't come back, we'd have an empty nest all season. And it just so happened that it coincided with the um, COVID pandemic as well. So we were all at home waiting for something to happen. And on the 2nd of April, who should turn up but CJ7? That date, again, um, she might have even got back on the 1st, but on the 2nd of April we got our first picture come through and she was on a different nest, which was um, really nerve-wracking for us. But we only had one image come through, um, which was interesting because she then went completely off the radar. Um, and we didn't see her for, for a number of days and we actually contacted the local um, wildlife protection um, group and made sure that we were allowed to go out and monitor and check that she wasn't setting up a nest somewhere else um, on some private land where we needed to ensure that she had the protection in place. So what we did is we monitored a couple of different areas at this time and we found her at the Osprey release site. Um, so she'd gone all the way there, she'd obviously been attracted again to the new release site where those birds um, were were released the previous year, um, which shows that they they are attracted to that. That that really is part of their mental map of the local area. That that is a productive space for them, right down to a single individual site that they're returning to. Um, so we were wondering what might happen. Is she going to set up at this release site? What's going to happen then? Um, but very very luckily, this happened a few days later. So she finally returned on the live stream webcam on the 8th of April, right early in the morning. I think this was about half five in the morning. Um, and it was stunning. It was stunning to see people wake up and see that there was an osprey on the live stream nest cam that we've been watching an empty nest for weeks. And it started, this, it was the start of a really important story between people who live locally, but people also from across the world who were really excited about CJ7. Kind of She's a signal of hope for a lot of people. It sounds a bit dramatic, but she is really a signal of hope for wildlife restoration on the South Coast um, and across um, the world, really. So we were very excited to see her back and that the story would start to unfold on camera. And it did just that. She's very fortunately that later that day started bringing in nesting material, building up that nest and displaying that behaviour again. And we were able to watch that in real time live, which was fantastic. 
I, this video makes me laugh because it's just so pitifully thrown across the nest. Um, but she's a very skilled nest builder. Um, and the shape of this nest changes throughout the season. On, on a natural nest it does as well. Um, they'll be doing different behaviours, some that we haven't seen before on the south coast, which we've been able to pick, picked up, which is this egg cup scraping. This hasn't been seen before on the south coast for, for the last or nearly 200 years. Um, but what's remarkable about ospreys is they're constantly changing the shape of the nest through the season. So they want a really tightly cupped nest at the start for if they lay eggs, um, which obviously we weren't expecting yet in the project. Um, but they want a very domed shape of the nest so that they don't roll around too much and they can protect them. But as the season goes on, they'll encourage the nest to, to build up and have a much flatter top for when those birds are getting ready to fledge, for when the chicks are getting ready to fledge. Um, so it's really interesting, the subtlety it might look like they're just placing their um, sticks down anywhere they want to, um, but they're actually, they've got a lot of planning going into that, um, which is really interesting. And seeing the egg cup scraping was so exciting, which we never really expected what happened next to happen. Um, so we've included this picture because <laughs> it's slightly, slightly wistful CJ7 looking out, waiting um, for LS7 to return. Um, we kept our hopes very high going on and on into the season, but sooner or later it became apparent that LS7 wasn't going to come back. Um, and there could be a number of reasons for that, but we have, we think we know why that might have been. And to demonstrate that, I just wanted to show you this wind map from uh, March 2020. Um, you can see all across northwestern Europe these really persistent northeasterly winds blowing out over into the Atlantic Ocean and to a migrating osprey that's heading north or to any migratory bird that is a real barrier and a real risk so in particular ospreys that are really really keen to get back to their breeding grounds some of them will make a really risky decision to cross the Bay of Biscay from northern Spain up into northern France and any individuals that did that during that period of 2020 there's a real risk that they would have been blown out and sadly probably didn't make landfall again um, and we think that this didn't just affect our population the the Welsh population lost three breeding males that year which is actually roughly 20 or 30 percent of their population um, the Scottish population had a lot of new individuals um, new turnover lots of well-established individuals didn't come back it wasn't just young birds older birds as well weren't returning um, and I think that demonstrates quite uh, crucially what Liv mentioned before about these smaller populations being so vulnerable. So the Welsh population, if there hadn't been a surplus of males nearby, um, that population would not have, um, or would have been really severely impacted by, by that just one year's worth of weather. And with climate change, these kind of weather events are becoming more frequent. So there is a risk of this in the future. So what we want to do is try and reinforce these populations. Um, and for us, it was the loss of our only potential breeding male um, and a, a real setback and it was a it was a real disappointment for us and, and obviously we'd all grown to love C, uh, LS7 as well and it was a shame not to see him back but CJ7 was unperturbed and she really did blow us away so on the 30th of April she laid her first unfertilized egg um, this is something that has been seen in ospreys before, but it's very rarely documented because it is very unusual to have a breeding condition female on a nest on her own and especially rare to have one with an, a nest camera on it. Um, so we'd like to think we're helping to contribute to the, the scientific understanding of the species by documenting these behaviours. She actually went on over the course of the next week to lay three eggs in total. What was really encouraging was that she didn't try to incubate these eggs. She didn't waste any more of her body condition or energy on keeping these eggs warm. She seemed to be aware on some level that these were not going to hatch and it's probably due to the absence of any mate that she, she knew that. So she didn't waste her energy on them. She was actually quite indifferent to them um, but we think that her body's physiology was just, she was so ready to breed that her body started going through the motions of producing eggs ready for breeding. Um, a lot of people felt very, very sorry for her at this point, um, but I think this for us was still a major milestone. So those eggs that you can see in that image are the first osprey eggs to be laid in southern Britain since 1847. 
Now, whether or not they're fertilised, I think that is a huge, huge success story and something that should absolutely be celebrated. Um, CJ7 was, like I said, she was quite indifferent to them. She left them unattended. Um, she left them unattended at night and we had a tawny owl come in and have a look at them. There are a number of other birds that went past and took a look, but actually nothing took them that year. Um, and in the end, she ended up burying them in the nest, um, just covering them over. And that's that process of keeping the nest hygienic as well that she was doing there. This is um, a really interesting bird. Like, like Brittany was saying, we had several different animals come up onto the nest um, during that year. We had tawny owls, we had um, nightjar come on in the night, which was fantastic to see. Um, but we did have a few instances where other ospreys came on the nest as well. Don't want to get your hopes up too much, it wasn't a male, um, but it was PT Zero, who um, was from a Scottish nest, Lock of the Lows in Scotland. Um, and what was really interesting for me is that this was a bird that I knew. I worked previously at Lock of the Lows back in 2018, the year before I moved down to Poole. And she was um, one of the chicks that fledged from the nest that year. Um, which was a little bit spooky for me because I was looking at the bird that I was primarily focused on um, in my career, but the previous one that I had been doing the, um, two years prior to that as well, somehow met up on this nest um, in Pool Harbour. And it's just fantastic that she was attracted into the area um, on her first migration back to the UK. She was exploring around just like females do, and she was attracted to the area um, by CV CJ7's presence again. So she stayed on the nest for two days actually, and I think as a young bird, she was really interested in what was going on, um, probably interested if there were any males around as well, if she could turf CJ7 out, um, which wasn't going to happen because CJ7 soon ousted her from the nest. It, it was also really interesting because when PT0 was ringed up by her, um, because we do weigh them, we take lots of metrics from them when they are ringed, um, and a lot of those go to influence on whether we think the bird is male or female. So. Even at such a young age, you can see the difference in weight and size of the females compared to the males. There's um, usually up to about 30% um, higher weight in females. And PT0 was just on that line. We weren't 100% sure whether she was male or female at that young age, about five weeks of age that they're ringed. Um, so a few of us were hoping that we might actually get a pair of ospreys that weren't from Pearl Harbor at all um, down here. It was the kind of desperation that you see at this stage in the project that maybe she might be a male and all things were, all things would be great. Um, but you can see that she's really large. She matches the, the size of CJ7. Um, so yeah, she was a female, but it was lovely to see another bird on the nest and them interacting together. CJ7, she became a bit of a local celebrity that year. Um, on the self-isolating bird club which started in the early stages of the pandemic but um, CJ7 was regularly seen on the nest that year um, live streamed onto the self-isolating bird club and they were kind of documenting the behaviours she was making um, and it was all really exciting but unfortunately we didn't have the breeding that year but she did start a bit of a fan club. We had lots of art made. Um, this A local um, sculptor, Paul Green, produced this stunning sculpture of CJ7 for um, the Lighthouse Museum, so you can go, um, Lighthouse Gallery, so you can go and see um, her there, which me and Brittany went the other week <laughs> and we took a picture with her. Um, so we're just as obsessed as you are. Um, but also this um, felted osprey from one of our, um, one of the partners of one of our volunteers, uh, Mabe, which was in our HQ while we were on Porky as well. I think you might be lagging a little bit at the moment. I'm just going to wait a few moments because I think we need to catch back up with ourselves. Are you getting anything on there at all? Just bear with us a moment. Thank you. Oh, it's going back up. Lovely. I hope you can still hear us. Um, maybe we've talked to you about ospreys for too long. <laughs> um, but we're just saying CJ7 really wrapped up the season nicely. Um, and we were really, really hoping, have high hopes that she'd come back again in 2021. Ex 
2021 could be the year that we see returnees from 2019 back in Port Harbour. So on the 1st of April, um, who should turn up on the nest again but CJ7? I think we are lagging quite a lot here. So if you get any delays from us, hopefully, hopefully you can hear us well. Um, but CJ7 turned up on the nest and she was um, already there. So we could hear her scratching and feeding on the nest post behind the camera. And we were all waiting to see if it was her when she jumped down onto the nest and see that leg ring, um, which was fantastic. That she returned back on that date, 1st of April, again, onto the nest site. So everything was set up for another good season. Um, and we were really excited to be going again. She actually started um, the process again, which we were um, not surprised to see, of laying eggs. So this year she laid a total of five eggs on the osprey nest. Um, she wrote, laid a series of three first, which were then taken by some local ravens, um, and then laid a further two um, not long after. And it was nice to see that the ravens were taking um, the benefit of the osprey eggs that were laid on the nest. Um, but again she wasn't incubating them she wasn't protecting them because if she was it wouldn't have been possible for those ravens to get in there so it was nice to see them being used um effectively um lovely i think we're back up and running again now which is fantastic so what we were really waiting for was the return of a male from 2019 in the project and it, all females from the project as well. We released quite a few that year, um, and we had that two-year buffer period where they've been in their in their wintering grounds, maturing, um, and we were waiting and hoping that they would come back. And on the 18th of May, we had this image come through to our phone. So, as Brittany mentioned before, we don't get the HD image come through immediately, which is incredibly nerve-wracking for us. But we scanned this image at seven o'clock in the morning. We were hoping, hoping, hoping that we could see a zero on what looked like a 22 on the right leg of the bird. Um, something to note here is also that birds that are ringed in Wales and um, England tend to be ringed on their right leg with the Darvik ring, whereas birds that are in Scotland are tend to be ringed on their left leg. So it gives us a big insight into the fact that this could be a bird that we've released in Pool Harbour with the fact that it's on its right leg. So we're really excited, very excited. And we got the HD image come through at nine o'clock. It was 022. So we called it right. We were very excited. Um, and we got this image come through of him on one of the nests, not the live stream nest um, in Pool Harbour, but another one with CJ7, she immediately found him. She must have a, some sort of homing beacon for these birds that come in because immediately she's with LS7 and immediately was with 022 on those nests and we're getting those lovely pictures coming through. This individual, he was released in 2019 and he was an incredibly strong and feisty, um, feisty young bird. He was um, making flights on the first day within the pens. Um, and he was also that bird that we saw leaving our migration um, back on the boat in 2019. So we'd seen this bird for the last time, boat full of people had seen him. So what? how could you have a better bird come back um, to tell the story and meet her with CJ7? It was certainly an interesting start to the season. Um, I think some people were overly protected of CJ7 because they weren't best impressed with how he was necessarily treating her. But he's a young bird, he was two years old, um, it was amazing that he was back um, and we wanted to see how he how quickly he built up his skills in um, nurturing the nest and also um, providing for CJ7 because there was still a little bit of time in the season where we thought there could be the chance that she lays more eggs. We saw that she'd laid five previously um, and there could be the chance that there's still a little bit of a window of time where we could have breeding that year. It was very unlikely because he was such a young bird and he hadn't got those skills yet. Um, but it was amazing to see him come and land on the nest for the first time, especially when we were all sitting waiting for this to happen. We knew it was going to happen. Um, and there he appeared, and it was stunning. So CJ7, she's got her wings quite low there, um, and when they sit low to the nest like that, it's a behaviour known as mantling. Um, and they often do it when they're defending their fish as well, defending their food. Um, it's not exactly a loving welcome that she's given him, but they seem quite comfortable with each other, which is fantastic. They've been on that other nest um, site in the harbour as well. 
and it was fantastic to see him. Um, we were watching them actually, um, we were scanning that morning and monitoring to see if we could pick them up. Um, and we watched him chase her across across um, to the nest, and he flew at such a fast rate. We knew that he was dedicated to her from that moment <laughs> on. Had no doubts in our minds that he was going to do a fantastic job. And within that day, the camera um, got pretty blue. Um, it was um, it was startling, actually, just just how quickly they got down to things. Um, and just a few a few days later, they were back on the last ever episode of the Self Isolating Bird Club. Um, for a fantastic finale. Bring us all up to date. For those who haven't been following you as uh, as uh, diligent as, as they should have on social media and, and your platforms, tell us what's happened this year with CJ7. Oh, we have on, her hold on. Paul, she before you start, returned. she's she's just turned up on the Let's next platform. Oh, wow, what about Perfect. that? Perfect, just on cue. Never... Oh, 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 yes. <laughs> Oh my word, oh, I don't need no. to explain anything. <laughs> no way, did oh. that just happen? <laughs> oh. Wow. <laughs> that is wow, 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 wow. <laughs> I don't think that could have gone any better, could it? Well, everything that happened from then was really quite textbook. This might not look like it, like it but this is a really good example of what we call... Uh, a food pass. So that's 022 on the right there. He was catching fish and he gradually learned to share them. Um, so what he's done there is he's, he's caught a fish, he's taken it for himself, started eating it, and then he's giving the rest of it to her. And that is a courtship behaviour he is trying to encourage her to make with him in the future. Um, and by the end of the season, he they got so good at this that he started leaving fish in the nest for her. Um, so what was fantastic was even though he returned a little bit too late to make a breeding attempt, they made excellent use of the summer and they really, really strengthened their pair bond. They even managed to get on quite well when they were doing nest building behaviours. Um, so we had both of them bringing in nesting materials, adding to the nest. Um, really, really encouraging to see them doing this together. I'd say that CJ7 was more skilled at this than uh, 022 was, bless him, but he, this wasn't a bad first attempt. Um, there was even a bit of cooperation going on. You can see there, lovely comparison, the size difference between the two. So 022 on the left, CJ7 on the, on the right, the females are just noticeably bulkier. Um, she's obviously a pro, knows what she's doing. <laughs> He's in the way. Um, he wants to lend a hand but they've got very different ideas about where they want to put the stick. <laughs> so maybe there's something to work on for next season. This season, potentially. Um, all of that stuff is so encouraging. We were really, really happy with the way that they were pairing up and the way they were using the harbour as well. And when we released our batch of chicks this year, uh, they found them very, very quickly and started interacting with them, just as CJ7 has done every year that we've released chicks since she first came here. Um, Really, really fantastic for him to encounter the juveniles as well, just to reinforce to him that this is a good place to breed. Um, and to see two adult birds, a male and a female, sat on a nest with a chick got us really quite excited about the potential for the future. Before we touch on that, though, we are just going to talk to you a little bit about some of the other successes that we've seen from the project. Shall I do this? Yeah. yeah. I will tell you all about some of the other stuff that's happened beyond Pool Harbour because there has been some really interesting stuff that's gone on. So I just want to talk to you again about our lovely LS7. This is the area where he was found wintering and like we said at the beginning it's very difficult to find birds on their wintering grounds. There's not the same level of, of bird watching out in West Africa there's not the same investment in uh, available in equipment for, for monitoring. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And it basically means that a lot of these areas, which are quite remote areas, don't get surveyed to see if the birds there are ringed. Um, but one area, this is the Sine de Saloum Delta, um, and this is just in yeah, just in that western edge of Senegal. There's an island called the Ile de Wazo, the island of the birds, and LS7 was found there in the early part of 2018, so that first winter after he departed Pool Harbour for the first time. 
he was located on that island by a local park ranger. Um, rather incredibly, he wasn't the only bird we heard back about that year. Um, another of the males from that year, LS3, was also seen literally only 20 kilometres away from where LS7 had turned up. Another really good part of Senegal for them to be overwintering in. And we actually got a photograph sent through of LS3. There's absolutely no doubt that is him. Um, that was so, so encouraging for us. That was our first kind of evidence that what we were doing was working. We did have some rather sad um, news from that year as well. Another of the males, so three different males we heard back about. LS6 was found in the Gambia, at really quite a, um, a good site for ospreys. But sadly, well, he was photographed looking like this. Um, you might notice that he looks a bit off balance there. He's actually missing all of his tail feathers. So we think he might have had a run in with a predator, a fortunate escape. Could have been a jackal, could have been a crocodile for all we know. And there's lots of possibilities. But sadly, we think that that probably impeded his ability to maybe fish or maybe to survive or maybe, maybe made him vulnerable to future predation. And sadly, he was later recovered um, and found dead. But still really really good data for us and really encouraging that we'd had all three of those individuals turn up in West Africa. From the second year of the project we also had a returning individual and remember that was a really tough year for us so to have birds returning from that year just means so much to us. This is 014. She is a female that we translocated in 2018 and I'm going to let Liv tell you about her. <laughs> I know this is a very special bird for you. <laughs> so, um, 014, she turned up um, on the Dovey Nest Cam um, back in 2020. And as Brittany's saying, she was one of the birds released in 2018. Um, a really stunning female. And we weren't expecting her to turn up in Wales. Um, we think it's something to do with the, the kind of migratory line. Um, it's a really nice, um, what would you call it? It's like a... Migratory like a yeah. nice migratory route that kind of sends them straight up through through um, Wales, and there's a lovely population there already, which kind of acts as a bit of a home beacon to to the birds that are moving through. And as we said before, these fam females come back in their second year, and they, they explore the UK, um, looking for territories and looking for potential nest mates. Um, yeah, across the across the country. So we were really, really hoping that she would come down back to Paul Harbour um, and see it, <laughs> come back and see um, if she would set up a territory here. Um, and she almost did. She was seen on the Axe Estuary in Devon, um, where there is one picture here, just on the, um, the bottom right, where she's actually seen with two fish, which is remarkable. So some, sometimes these birds are hunting in such um, waters which are so densely populated with fish that they can actually pick up two at the same time. If you've ever seen an osprey hunt, it's absolutely spectacular. You know, they'll, they'll hover above the water, 100 feet above the water, and drop, drop down and hover again before they make this spectacular d dive. And if we ever see a bird catch two fish in Pool Harbour, <laughs> that'll be it. That'll, that'll be done. That's, <laughs> I don't need to do anything else in my life. Um, but it is fantastic to see her doing so well and photog um, photographed by so many people and we were thinking maybe, maybe, maybe she'll come over to Paul Harbour um, because it would just be a half day trip for her, it wouldn't be very far at all to come. But she went back up to Wales. Um, actually I'm going to pass back over to Brittany <laughs> because she often refers to 014 as her child so um, I think she'd like to tell you a bit about this. So yeah, 014 went straight back to Wales, literally within the space of a few weeks, and in tow she had two other young birds, both of them male. One of them was from the Lake District and the other one was from Scotland. Again, just displaying that nomadic behaviour moving around. She turned back up at Dovey at a stage when the chicks were just kind of before fledging. They were very much ready to go. And I think all of that really solidified her relationship with Wales. Um, so when she returned in spring 2021, where did she go? She went to Wales. She actually went not to Dovey, where she'd been seen so frequently. She went to Glaslin, um, where actually last year they had a difficult year at Glaslin. Um, unfortunately, uh, the male became injured and sadly they lost the chicks. But there is another nest there that was put up by friends of the Ospreys. And 014 settled there alongside Z2, which is a young dovey male. He's a year older than her. He was um, hatched in 2017. And 
They had, I'm happy to say, a successful breeding season. They produced a single chick. She laid the usual clutch of three eggs. We don't know why only one of them hatched, but it can be quite typical of young, inexperienced breeders. Both of these birds breeding for the first time. They produced a young male called, well, ringed 494. Um, and lives right. I do refer to this particular individual as my grandchild on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> but it represents another huge milestone for the project in that that is the first osprey chick, the first progeny to come as a direct result of our translocation project. Of course, we'd love it to be in Pool Harbour, but what 014 has done here is something that we hope uh, female ospreys from Pool Harbour are going to continue to do for generations to come, which is to move over into other populations and help support them. And actually, 494, we know that he at least made it off on the first leg of his migration because he was photographed in Brittany, in France, on the 10th of September last year, on the first leg of his migration. Looks like he was making a fishing attempt there. Let's hope he caught something and carried on well on his journey. And maybe next year we might see him back. Who knows, he might even stop by and visit us in Pool Harbour. Another bird that was really excited, I, I was extremely excited about seeing um, this bird photograph because um, she was released in the first year of the project that I started, so back in 2019. And um, 019 was photographed just on Christmas Eve um, in Gunja Quarry in the Gambia um, by Joanna Daly. There's a fantastic team out there who regularly send us updates and some photos through if they get any, any images of the birds we've released. And... We were so excited, couldn't have asked for a better Christmas present of um, seeing these photos of 019. Particularly so because 019, she was the opposite of LS7. She was the last bird to fledge. She was very timid. She um, stayed, to, stayed to herself, last bird to fledge, um, last bird to leave on migration, and regularly got herself into like sticky situations, sitting on um, electricity wires right where we don't want them to sit. Um, we put bird scarers out and everything, but she was not perturbed. Um, she she was regularly found doing things that we definitely didn't want our chicks to be doing. So the fact that she was seen, with all the other ospreys that we released that year in the Gambia, was remarkable. And I had very high hopes for the rest of rest of the cohort that year if she, if she was successful in making the crossing. And what was really, really exciting is she was photographed again in um, early 2021. And this was just prior to, the, um, to her potential return back to the UK for the first time. So she's set up in this fantastic wintering territory where it's actually really hard for young birds to establish um, because it's, it's so good that there's a huge number, um, 40 to 50 overwintering adult ospreys, sometimes more than that, in one single area. Um, and she made her claim to that area and she managed to establish herself there. Um, so she surprised us at every every turn. And she returned back to um, to <laughs> the country again, but to Wales again. <laughs> so um, she was seen at Glaslin just, just shy of the nest with 014 in um, on the 5th of June last year. And she was seen um, looking very astute here on the nest. Um, absolutely stunning bird, very healthy condition. You can see that she's really well fed. She returned back to the UK for the first time. Who knows what's going on with these females that they're not going back to Pool Harbour, but it was just, it was excellent to see her back and looking so good um, up in Wales. We actually, a few weeks ago, got more images of her back in the Gambia. Um, so we know she survived that journey back to um, West Africa again. And we're really keeping our fingers crossed that hopefully she'll come back a little bit sooner this year, potentially set up and maybe find her own territory, a breeding territory this year, maybe in Wales, maybe in Bull Harbour, we'll have to see. Um, but we're really, really pleased to see that she's thriving um, in West Africa at the moment. So just looking ahead with the project, um, what we've got to look forward to in this, this year, well, the 1st of April is on Friday, so we're all getting extremely excited. We've got a coordinated Osprey watch going on on Friday with us stationed all around the harbour. Um, so we encourage everyone to try and get out get out and looking for Ospreys this week with the first birds turning up in the harbour today. Um, but CJ7, that's the date we've all got in our diaries, um, but we're looking out for her. Hopefully she'll return again. Um, it'll be fantastic to see her back in the area. But we're looking forward to seeing any more translocated birds return again. Obviously, we've got 022, 
the bird we're really, really hoping will come back. He's going to be a little bit older now, he'll be a three-year-old, so that means he could really turn up at any time. They usually turn up slightly later, but with this instinct to breed that he had last year, that he demonstrated last year, he could turn up any time, we don't know. Um, but we're really, really excited to see when that might be, and fingers crossed we have a really nice weather system coming through. Um, the last week's been fantastic, um, but we want to hope that he'll, he'll make it back this year. We might also see 019, just as I've just mentioned, back in the UK. Um, who knows where she'll set up, but it would just be fantastic to see her back, whatever happens. And then next year, we'll be looking for returners from 2021. Um, but birds release them because we've got a two year latency period um, waiting for them to come back. So we've still got a while to go with the project, really. Yes, yeah, so a lot of you will know already, but we just wanted to sort of re announce it for everyone that we have been granted permission to extend the translocation project to, by two years. So originally, this year, well, last year, just gone, was supposed to be the final year of the translocation project. But because of the losses that we incurred in the second year of the project, and also because of the gap that we took during 2020, we have been granted a two-year extension by Natural England and Scottish Natural Heritage. So we will be going ahead, all being well, with the translocation this year, and then we will also have our final year of the translocation next year. And what that means is that we are just going to be bolstering the local population as much as possible, increasing the chance as much as we can that we're going to have individuals coming back and establishing in Pool Harbour. And what might that look like over the years? So this is very, this is very much, um, this is very much wishy thinking. This is what we would love to see happen over the next 20 years in Pool Harbour. But what it is really is to help demonstrate to you what the aims of the translocation project are for us. So we want to establish that local population here on the south coast in Pool Harbour. We want other birds to disperse along and recover the historical range of this species in Pool Harbour. We want birds to move up to other populations and start bolstering those existing populations, facilitating that genetic mixing, just like those females had started to do. And then we also want them to start recolonizing areas in between those populations and connecting up with the continental population because when we talk about ospreys or many large raptor species we we can't afford to think small we have to think on a meta population level we need to think about the species in, on the continent as a whole um so i hope that you know i doubt the population will look like this in 20 years time but what a lovely thing to be aiming for to consider that we might have ospreys recolonizing some of those areas along the south coast of Britain and maybe across into France as well. You'll probably all have seen this video already, but this <laughs> this is probably our most watched video of all time. Um, this happened the other day. Our colleagues Paul and Joe have been renovating the live stream nest. We nicely uh, put some nice moss in there ready for breeding ospreys and who should appear hours later but a raven carrying two bourbons. <laughs> this video raised so many more questions for us than it answered. We have no idea where that bird got those biscuits from, why it buried them there. They were stolen by carrion crows the next morning, who must have been watching from afar. Um, but what we need now is for ospreys to do something even more miraculous and ridiculous, like make a breeding attempt, um, so we can <laughs> continue to get those lovely views from everyone who's enjoyed watching that content so far. And of course what we're trying to do is hopefully get a breeding pair this year, the first pair um, in 180 years, um, which will be remarkable. So what we've been busy in Brittany has been fantastic the last um, few months, trying to set up different opportunities and different nests around the harbour because at the end of the last season, these birds were displaying over several different nests in the harbour, um, which we didn't expect to see. So it's no guarantee if they do return, that they'll come back to this nest. So we've been busy over the winter trying to prepare um, lots of different sites and hopefully we'll be able to um, give you an insight into um, those different nests should they return anywhere else other than the main live stream site. Um, but it's incredibly exciting and I just mentioned about them displaying over the nest. We'll just round off the presentation with um, this lovely footage that's taken. 
So if you want any more information about the um, project, if you haven't fulfilled <laughs> your Osprey, Osprey needs this evening, um, we do have more information on the website. Um, but of course, we'll be doing lots and lots of events. We've got Spring Safari Cruises, um, which are going over the next few weeks, um, which we'll hopefully be able to get our first one on in the next in the next few a few um, attempts. Um, we were really, really hoping to see them this Sunday, but ended up seeing the white-tailed eagles, which, you know, um, is amazing. Um, but we're really hoping to see ospreys soon. Um, and then we've got those 30 Osprey um, <laughs> Osprey cruises in August as well. We really, really like running um, free Osprey events too. So we've been doing pop-up Osprey watches across Pool Harbour, particularly at Ham Common, um, BCP Ham Common Viewpoint, where we're able to scan the Wareham Channel looking in for birds that are migrating through Pool Harbour in August, where we can get up to 10 birds at one any one day um, fishing in Pool Harbour as a stopover location. So we'll be announcing those... Um, a few days prior to them being able to run because we'll be judging the, the number of ospreys in the area and the weather at that time so keep an eye on our events page and our social media um, if you're really really keen to see your first osprey in Pool Harbour. The, the last thing to really say is thank you for watching and um, we hope you continue to watch the webcam um, and keep our fingers crossed for Friday and um, we might get the return of CJ7 but yeah thank you for joining us. Thank you ever so much and what we're going to do now is we're going to see if we can read the comments on YouTube. If, there, if anyone does have any questions, you can try and put them in. Um, I'm going to see if I can get it working. <laughs> we might have to try it on the laptop because my phone's a bit, get a bit, a bit precarious. Um, one of the questions that we often get asked that I'm sort of anticipating someone might ask is, um, do ospreys and eagles come into conflict with each other? Because obviously we're getting these um, these interact well not interactions yet but we're, I mean actually at the end of last season we did get a white-tailed eagle and an osprey interacting late quite late in September I think it was and um, we had uh, one of the white-tailed eagles from the Isle of Wight in the harbour at the same time as the osprey and there was a bit of an altercation between them um, so people are often worried about maybe they might have um, some impact on the, on the distribution of each other so what we're um, what we're telling everyone is what we've learnt from, from our colleagues at the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation um, and also from um, experiences of other people in other countries is that ospreys and eagles can coexist and do coexist. Um, there probably is a hierarchy to some extent. Um, often the eagles, obviously, I mean, the eagle is such a big and powerful bird that ospreys really, um, they don't stand a chance against an eagle should they come into conflict with them. So what they tend to do is they learn that ospreys, uh, that eagles, if they, for example, want to take their food, which eagles will often do because eagles are kleptoparasitic, so they will steal fish from other birds, um, or any other animal, to be honest, any food they will try and take. Um, but from ospreys, they will potentially try and take fish. And I've heard stories from over in, uh, in Finland, actually, where you have ospreys and eagles coexisting, an osprey catches a fish, it sees an eagle coming, and it immediately drops the fish and just goes and gets another one because there is absolutely no chance of uh, <laughs> of an eagle, basically, uh, of an osprey keeping hold of that fish when an eagle's coming. It knows it's not worth it to try and waste its energy to keep hold of that fish. But they can and do coexist in, in lots of places, including in Scotland. Um, and although they are eating similar things, they're both eating mullet, um, we are pretty confident that there's enough mullet in Pool Harbour to sustain both species. We're just trying to get the uh, the live stream up and running so we can see anyone's comments. Bear with us now. We're really testing our <laughs> bandwidth to the limit yeah, here. pushing it a bit. <laughs> we were going to do this talk in our office this evening and we realised that the, uh, the bandwidth was not good enough. Okay, let's so. have a look. Okay. How do I get the chat window open? It's testing our knowledge of technology as well now. Here we go. Oh, excellent.
Oh no, it's not <laughs> Here we go. I'm seeing a few comments from people about um, the buffering of the video. We apologise for that. Um, I think some of the videos were probably pushing it a little bit, weren't they? Brilliant. Lots of people saying thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Really appreciate you all coming along. I don't think we've got any questions in there. I think that means we <laughs> said just enough, or maybe <laughs> talk too much. And we've got how many chicks are you planning to release over each of the last years of the project? You know, what's that? Yeah, so um, this, well, like you've probably seen from the data we presented, it does vary year on year, and really it's just based on how many chicks are we can, you know, Roy Dennis can feasibly collect of an appropriate age and size during that period. Ideally, we're aiming for 12 chicks per year with that bias towards males, um, but it's it's very um, difficult to, to actually always hit those exact numbers. So, for example, this year, uh, this year just gone, 2021, we were aiming for 12 birds and we ended up getting 10. Um, so I think we have a license to do at least 12 for the next two years, so that's definitely what we'll be aiming for. Um, but you never know. Um, with the pens, we tend to put three chicks in each pen at a time, keep it very similar to the natural nesting situation, and we've got four of those release pens, so um, we'd have to build more pens if we wanted to do any more than 12 maximum, so um, that's, what we'll be, that's definitely what we'll be aiming for, if possible have another question which is do you record the Darvik rings of the passage ospreys that we get through and do we see any patterns emerging from those records so um we do we do we keep a um a good diary of any birds that we get coming through the harbour that we can record um and any photo photos that are taken if anyone of you are keen photographers please send us any photos especially if they've got le leg rings in we do try to identify birds by their underwing as well so um birds like beaky who had that huge bill which gave her a name we've been able to monitor her as well to see if she comes back to the harbour each year um but yeah we do um how many birds have we seen returning back i think not too many we've seen repeatedly mm -hmm. coming back through Pool Harbour, um, but if we do, then that was certainly something to be look out for. Like CJ Seven's been coming back multiple years and established that territory, um, so it's definitely something we're looking out for. It's also something that we're finding increasingly as well. Mm -hmm. So, despite the fact that um, fewer and fewer purport a lower and lower proportion of the chicks are being ringed each year because of um, the fact that the population in Scotland is now so big that you can't actually um, see all of those, um, well, you couldn't possibly ring all of those chicks, essentially. Um, actually, because we're seeing an increasing number of birds passing through Pool Harbour, probably because of the presence of the chicks and now the resident adult birds, um, we are getting more and more opportunities to see birds and see if they are 